Greetings and blessings. We turn our focus towards the arrival of Lent and its hopeful call to reflect inward, shine outward, and be unhidden on the hill of our collective soul. Let us join prayers together with full hearts, eager to share both burden and delight. And so we pray. Give grace to the many sick and suffering around us. Thank you for the ability to pay the bills. For those feeling lonely and alone, may you offer comfort and companionship. God, my family is suffering. Help us find peace amidst the turmoil. The semester is almost halfway done and I'm excited to graduate. Thank you, God. I continue to struggle with an ailing body. Lord, please help me endure and not lose spirit. COVID has hit my family hard again and I am frustrated and can't find the words to express myself. Lord, help our country heal. God of joy and love, we offer these prayers and those hidden in our hearts and our thankfulness for your gifts and kindness and long-suffering. We ask for strength and stamina in the days ahead towards Lent and for patience as we grow in the process, transformed, trusted, and eager for your will to be done, now and forever. Amen. Greetings and welcome. We're again broadcasting from the Martin Meditation Chapel here at the campus of Ottawa University. From last week, you remember that if you go out that door, go down the hall, you go to the Fredrickson Chapel. Um, this uh, particular season, this semester, we're going to alternate broadcasts between the Martin Meditation Chapel, which is a bit more informal, going back to the Fredrickson Chapel, which is a bit more formal, with the anticipation that we should have maybe people back in those pews to actually worship live with us. We'll do a hybrid after that. That's our hope, depending on how COVID goes. It is nice to be back here. I've been in the Meditation Chapel doing these broadcasts now for a couple of years, so it's comfortable. And it's comfortable to sort of be in street clothes and not have on the formal regalia. With all that said, the theme that we talked about last week, what we're going to talk about going forward, going into Lent, is that concept of fate and destiny. And, and how those things are sort of brokered, how one and the other blend in or maybe discount each other. <clears throat> and there's an interesting part of the reading that you'll hear from Frank today. And in that, there's that whole concept where someone says of Jesus, he is destined to sort of shake up the world, um, to, to both cause comfort and discomfort for nations. That is his destiny. Now, that's different than that concept that says he's destined to save humanity or to sacrifice, to lay down his life so that we can be redeemed, all the things we think of. That shake-up concept. But it makes us think of Jesus as he curses the fig tree. It, it makes us think of Jesus as, as, he, as he tears up the temple when he doesn't approve of what's going on there. That side of Jesus that says that even though he's here to help and, and sanctify and save, he also has to stand up for what is true. And that is sometimes that difference between destiny, which can be hard, and fate, which says that the truth sometimes is the truth we want to hear or the truth we want to believe, but not the real truth. Jesus, then, that concept of being the way, the truth, and the life, that's the real deal. It's not just something we choose to believe because it's more convenient. And that's interesting. When Sarah talks in her reading about that concept of, of burnishing, the refiner's fire, the burnishing of that metal, and taking that metal and, and quickening it, making it sharper and stronger and better, and that in itself, that comes many times through a pretty difficult process, heat and, and toil and sweat and hammering. And, and from that, something amazing comes. But, but that is that rain that falls on the good and bad alike. That is the thing that we can experience and expose ourselves now when the world is sort of crazy with, with COVID and angry people 
so that it really can change that concept of where fate may take us to the destiny that God has in store for the world through us as we are refined. So let's listen to some music, to the scriptures that are coming up, and then we'll talk about how this is going to work as we go into our Lenten time in the desert, how we can work to refine ourselves so we can emerge stronger and tougher and better, more pure and more open to God's will as we get closer and closer to Easter. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purify of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness, and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as in days gone by and as in former years. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice of keeping with what is said in the law of the land, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It has been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child of Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servants in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations a light for revelation to the Gentiles 
and the glory of your people, Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary to his mother, this child is destined to cause this fall, falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Peniel and the tribe of Asher. She was very old and she had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until he, she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at this very moment, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. When my youngest um, had his 13th birthday, he fell in love with this amazing Japanese sword. And it had several dragons on it with large dragon mouths and beautiful dragon jewels, most of which I think were probably not real dragon jewels, but they were pretty stunning. And it was covered in this um, gold, sort of antiqued gold. And, and we found it, I, I think, and he might correct me, I think it was on eBay. And it was one of those things that was listed as antique samurai sword. And when we got it and unwrapped it and it came from Asia, it smelled a little bit of smoke. Now, at the time I thought it smelled like liquid smoke, but still it smelled of smoke. And the story that surrounded this sword was that it was like excavated from a tomb. And he was so immensely happy and proud of the sword. He loved the sword. And he told all his friends that he had gotten the sword because well, it was excavated from a tomb. And we talked about the smoke. And, uh, you know, it was sort of, again, marginally distressed. And, uh, and he put it on a wall in his bedroom using the, th the thing that I would hang my guitar on. So it's this little neck thing. And he put the sword there. And it was right across from his bed. And a couple of times I caught him talking to the sword as part of his nightly routine. Blah, 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 he would say his prayers and he would tell the sword good night. The sword was a huge deal. It was a huge deal. It was a huge deal for a long time. <clears throat> well, one day, and we had a very large dog named Keegan, and Keegan was a wolfhound and Keegan was big. And Keegan had a tail, and a lot of big dogs don't have tails, but, but Keegan did. And his tail, I swear, weighed about 100 pounds. And if it hit you in the face, it would knock you silly. And Keegan, being excited, came in to Sean's room, and Scotty's sword was there on the wall. And the boys were talking. To make a very long story short, he got excited, as he tended to do. We called it kabunga -wucking. He went up, the tail went down, and the sword flew through the air and shattered into a million pieces. Really did, shattered like glass. Now, besides the fact that it was very dramatic, um, what we realized was that the sword was maybe not as true as it had been made to believe, which we already had suspected some. But there was some way, a, a sort of a reckoning where you could no longer deny that the sword was clearly not excavated. Partially because the metal, it seemed, was coated with what looked like a foil, and a lot of that distress was coming off. And so what you had is this mountain of pieces of things that were not at all what they purported to be. In front of my two boys, one of whom who had said goodnight to the sword for a long period of time. And he was truly heartbroken. It turned into a really interesting learning experience between my kids with my older boy saying to my younger one, it is what you made it to be. If you felt that it was an interesting and amazing sword that came out, if you gave it reference, then it gave you joy. And it doesn't really matter that it was made by someone in a sweatshop in Asia. And you got a deal now, didn't you? And he did get a deal. It was an eBay deal, I believe. So, you know, I've thought about that a lot in the last few years when I hear stuff on the news that doesn't seem real to me, but I hear other people feel is real. And from everything, from, from COVID to politics to when I hear people so adamantly sure, so, so ready to say goodnight to something that I think in Asia they would call a straw dog. 
A straw dog is something you buy for a sacrifice, so you don't have to kill a real dog. They burn the straw dogs. They know it's just an effigy of a dog, but it saves you from doing it. I think about that change in the Old Testament where we, where the angel stayed the hand of Abraham, where we no longer have to kill our firstborn child to make a deity happy, and to understand that we still have the same, in fact, a stronger connection with God without having to kill something that's precious to us that we as a people can grow and mature. We can decide that there is benefit in something because of its worth, even if its value is not there. We can love something because it was grandma's or because it was on our wall or because it reminds me of home. Even when that something is cheap and badly made because that causes us to feel love. That, to me, is the very Christian thing I would hope us all to, to experience. What I've had to realize in the, fast, the last few years is it also can cause us to feel hate. And, and I think that that's what I didn't understand. I guess I didn't realize how fortunate it was that I had kids that used that sword and its fall from grace as a learning experience and I think felt a little sad, certainly my youngest did, that it wasn't what it purported to be. But he didn't hate the people that sold it. He didn't hate the fact that, I mean, at the end of the day, he was sort of sad, but he realized what it was, and real is real. As Christians, then, we have to look for those times in a world where people, including people evoking Christ's name, are saying how much they hate a particular segment of people. I don't think it's possible for anyone who's, who's a Christian, who believes truly in the concept of Jesus and turning the other cheek and those beatitudinal issues and going the extra mile in praying for our persecutors, to talk of hate, to talk of hate as part of fulfilling God's expected work on earth. God does not ask us to hate. As Christians, we believe that God is love. So why does that matter in the realm of burnishing? Because our destiny as Christians is to follow a God of love in a world right now that's full of hate, where people want you to hate things with them. In the realm of love then, storge, that kind of love, if you join our club, you have to hate this. Now that's not new, that's not new to humanity. We've hated people for race and creed and color, for faith, for ethnicity, we've hated as long as people have been about. But Christians are different. Christos, goody goodies. And that is what we're called to do as we start going into the Lenten season to think about how we can burnish hate and turn it into love. The chances of God requiring you to lay down your life for a friend or a persecutor in this day and age are probably pretty slight. In fact, most Christians, I think, think about Christian privilege now much more than they think that someone's going to stone them if they don't deny the fact that they're Christian. We live in different times. But the best way to honor God and to win converts is to show that when you're angry or sad, when your heart's been broken because your sword's fake, that you can love, that you can learn that you can understand what Jesus would do. Even when Jesus was angry, when Jesus was burnishing things, when he was tossing people out of the temple or cursing that fig tree, he did it because he had hope that we could be better. And that's truly what we have to do through Lent. We have to find the hope that those that annoy us now that are fakes or frauds or not real or believe or delusioned by things that are not true, can be better, can grow closer to God, and can grow closer to God's truth. So as we get ready to start this Lenten journey, the first hard question you need to do this charge for this week is examine if there's anything in your life that is not real, do you have any swords on your wall that you say goodnight to that maybe are fake? Even swords that are fake can still be worth a lot. They can still be worth a lot because you love them or because they came from your mom or your dad or your granny. But you have to know that they aren't real. 
They're merely a representation of something that you care about. And you have to call it out. Because without that, as Pontius Pilate would say, what does truth mean? Nothing. Again, it doesn't mean that you hate them. It just means you know them for what they are. Take an inventory then this week. Make sure your truths are truths. Make sure your truths are God's truth. And that will get us in a good position as we go down the journey together to burnish ourselves for Jesus' death and resurrection at Easter. Let's close in prayer then. God, we live in complicated times. <laughs> it is our blessing and our curse. We are so glad that you are with us to help us not only winnow out what is real and what is not, but also to balm us and treat us when we are hurt by things that make us feel misled. When any noun, person, place, or thing is not what it purports to be. When the healing cure we see advertised does not cure the problem we have. When the person we had faith in to lead us in an area ends up being just as human as we are. We know, God, that you do not fail us. You allow us to snuggle down in your palm when we're really sad or mad or overwhelmed. Help us to stay there in your palm until we are ready to go back into the world and exhibit your grace. Grace even to those who persecuted us. Grace even to those who were not truthful to us. Grace even to those who have failed us. To truly love our enemy and to pray for our persecutors as hard, as hard as that is to do. Help us to stay awake in the garden when you need us to be constant. Help us to know when it is time to shake up the world and when it's time to give it your calm. And above all, God, help us to burnish ourselves to better serve you, to use that refiner's fire to be a blade that can be a sword and a plowshare that can heal and cut, can do surgery, can cause people to take pause. But as we do that, help us always make sure that it points towards you, not towards us, that we are ambassadors of Christ and that we work to truly do your call and will. Thank you for the opportunity to start this journey soon. Help us to emerge stronger and better and help the world to remember who it is and more importantly, to remember who you are. We ask this in your name. Amen.
Give the life.